Welcome to our next session. The impact of COVID-19 on workers' compensation is, of course, on everyone's mind here. In this session, we will present WCRI research on the impact of COVID-19 and the shutdown on claims composition and on the delivery of medical care. Our presenter today is WCRI's own Dr. Alessia Fomenko. Alessia, the stage is now yours. Thank you, John. And I'm happy to be here and present our findings on the early fact of COVID-19 on workers' compensation. With this research, we ask essential questions for understanding the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on workers' compensation. For COVID-19 claims, we ask how does the prevalence of COVID-19 claims compare across states for the first two quarters of 2020? We also discuss a variation that we see across states. For non-COVID-19 claims, we ask how did the number of workers' compensation claims change in the first quarters of the pandemic? We also examine the share of lost time claims and see if there are any changes. Finally, we look at the time from injury to treatment and see, evaluate whether that was impacted. For the scope of our study, we include 27 states um, we focus on claims with payments for either medical or income benefits for claims with injuries in this first two quarters of 2019 or 2020. So that we do not include claims with reserves only or zero dollar claims. To identify COVID-19 claims, um, we rely on nature of injury codes for COVID-19 or cause of injury code for pandemic. So let's start by looking at our findings for COVID-19 claims. And here I'm, um, I'm showing you the percentage of COVID-19 claims out of all claims um, with injury dates in the second quarter of 2020. And immediately you see large variation across states in the prevalence of COVID-19 claims, ranging from 1% in South Carolina to 34% in New Jersey and 42% in Massachusetts. In the median state, 6% um, of all claims were COVID-19 claims. Next, if we focus, limit our attention to lost time claims, um, since COVID-19 claims are more likely to be lost time claims, mainly uh, because of quarantine, um, or at least partially for quarantine requirements, we see larger shares of them among lost time claims. And the median state, um, the percentage goes to 20% now, and uh, from at the high end, New Jersey and Massachusetts, we see 58, 59% respectively. And once again, we do see large variation across state in the prevalence of COVID-19 claims. So at this time, uh, you may be thinking why uh, there is such substantial variation across states in the prevalence of COVID-19 claims. And over the next few slides, I will show you that the timing and severity of the pandemic is an important factor explaining this variation. Also differences in compensability rules matter. It's also important to remember that we're looking at the shares of workers' comp uh, of COVID-19 claims um, out of all workers' compensation claims. And the states that were uh, hit the hardest by the pandemic. Uh, so not only high volume of COVID-19 claims, but also substantial reductions in non-COVID-19 claims. So that for those states, we also have shrinking denominator here, and that amplifies the share of COVID-19 claims in these states. So this is something just to keep in mind when we see this um, wide variation across states. We also looked at the industry mix and that proved to be only a small factor behind this variation. So here we're looking, we're going back to um, uh, percentage of COVID-19 claims out of all workers' compensation claims for the second quarter of 2020. And here, um, and 
I'm adding also information on the severity of pandemic as captured by COVID-19 deaths per million in general population. And cl clearly one can see that prevalence of COVID-19 claims um, is associated with the spread of the virus at the time. And the states that were hit the hardest by the pandemic in the second quarter of 2020, such as Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts also had some of the highest uh, percentages of COVID-19 claims. On the other hand, states that saw a lo lower um, COVID-19 death numbers per million of population also had some of the um, lowest numbers in the percentage of COVID-19 claims. So um, we do see association uh, between severity of pandemic and the prevalence of COVID-19 claims. Next, again, I'm showing you again, looking at the percentage of COVID-19 claims out of all claims for um, second quarter of 2020. And here I'm, I'm um, highlighting states that um, implemented COVID-19 presumption law by the end of the second quarter of 2020. And they're shown here in yellow. And you can see that these states tend to have um, higher percentage of COVID-19 claims. With some exception, um, New Jersey and Massachusetts, they didn't have at the time COVID-19 presumption laws in place, and they had some of the highest percentages of COVID-19 claims out of all workers' compensation claims. So um, they had some other workers' compensation system features contributing to these high numbers. And for Massachusetts, that was pay without prejudice, that is commonly practiced in a state. Uh, New Jersey, on the other hand, um, it actually passed um, uh, COVID-19 specific presumption law in September, but at this time, um, it had a more general um, presumption law that established workers' compensation coverage for public safety workers um, in the event of them contracting communicable disease uh, during an epidemic. So for COVID-19 claims, we also um, examine the um, industry composition of the COVID-19 claims. And for that, we um, classified all industries into eight um, categories, into eight groups, and looked at the COVID-19 uh, claim distribution across these groups. And as you can see here, um, COVID-19 claims heavily concentrated in high-risk services. More than 60% of all COVID-19 claims were happening among employees of high-risk services and followed by low-risk services, um, about um, another 20% of COVID-19 claims. So you, you can see that um, service industries and have a majority of um, COVID-19 claims by the end of the second quarter of 2020. And because of the importance of service industries, we decided to look at closer at them and see where exactly COVID-19 uh, claims were happening. And here I'm showing you that um, vast majority of them were, uh, were happening, occurring among employees of assisted living facilities, hospitals, and uh, physician offices. And here I'm showing you results for the first two quarters of 2020. Oops. Yes. Um, so in other words, we see um, a large share of COVID-19 claims happening in the healthcare industry. And because of the importance of healthcare industry for, um, um, for the prevalence of COVID-19 claims in workers' compensation, we also uh, computed percentage of COVID-19 claims out of all workers employed in healthcare industry. And 
um, as one would expect, we do see higher shares, higher percentages of COVID-19 claims among employees of uh, healthcare industry than across all industries. And in the median state, it goes up to 34%. And in Massachusetts, it reaches as, as much as 75%. Another important observation from this chart is that the pattern of interstate variation is still there. And states that were hit hardest by the pandemic, such as Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, also have the highest um, percentage of COVID-19 claims in the healthcare industry. So that's um, another, um, um, another way to see that industry mix did not play a role in that, in the differences across states and the percentage of COVID-19 claims. So now let's shift our attention to non-COVID-19 claims. And here we're gonna see the impact of the massive economic slowdown, a stay at home policies and switching to work from home on the volume of um, workers' compensation claims, non-COVID-19 workers' compensation claims. And um, in this slide, we're showing the change in the number of non-COVID-19 workers' compensation claims from the second quarter of 2019 to the second quarter of 2020. Um, as you can see, all states uh, experienced claim reduction um, from 2019 to 2020. And the majority of states had at least 30% reduction in the volume of non-COVID-19 claims and as much as 50% in Massachusetts. This slide also um, brings information on the employment uh, changes for the same time period for each state. And that's captured by the red line here. As you can see again, all state experienced sharp drops in the employment for the same time period. So that must be, um, that likely to be an important factor behind um, decreases in the workers' compensation claims. However, it's important to know that the employment reduction does not explain the full magnitude of um, reduction in the volume of workers' compensation claims. Another interesting observation for non-COVID-19 claims is that we found almost no change uh, in the injury composition of non-COVID-19 claims when we compared injury distribution uh, between 2020 and 2019 second quarter injuries. We also looked at the last time claims and we find that the share of last time claims so, or claims with more than seven days of last time increased from uh, the second quarter of 2019 to the second quarter of 2020. And there are at least two contributing factors to that. First, non-COVID-19 claims um, were more likely to have more than seven days of last time in 2020 than in 2019. And also COVID-19 claims were more likely to have more than seven days of lost time than non-COVID-19 claims. So these two factors were shaping of what we um, see, what we saw for the increasing share of lost time claims among um, workers' compensation claims. So, so far we've seen um, that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic impacted the volume of workers' compensation claims. Uh, let's now see if there are any delays or any changes in the time from injury to treatment. And for this part of the presentation, I will focus on non-COVID-19 claims with paid medical services and, uh, and claims with more than seven days of lost time. And to discuss our findings 
uh, for medical treatment patterns, we will take on two perspectives. First, uh, more immediate, we will look at the more immediate impact of the pandemic. And for that, we will consider claims with injury dates in the first two quarters of 2020 and compare results for them to claims with injury dates in the first two quarters of 2019. And also, we will take a look at the impact of the pandemic on the existing claims. And for that, we will look at the claims with injury dates in the third and fourth quarters of 2019 and compare results for them to claims with injury dates in the third and fourth quarters of 2018. So here I'm showing you average number of days from injury to treatment. Um, for evaluation and management services, emergency room visits, PT services, and surgeries. And I will come, I will show, and here we're looking at the results for claims with injury dates in the first two quarters of 2020, that's shown in yellow bars. And we compare that to the injuries um, in first and second quarters of 2019. Overall, we can say that we don't see any evidence of delays in medical treatments for the service types. For the first, uh, for the um, uh, Q1 and Q2 injuries. Uh, for Q2 injuries, here we even see slight improvement in timing before um, the surgery, about two days reduction and, and similar change for PT services. Overall here, you can see that duration before from injury to treatment is shorter for Q2 injuries than uh, Q1 injuries here. And that's to a large degree can be explained by our data structure. Um, for both um, Q1 and Q2 injuries, um, data is evaluated as of June 30, 2020 for 2020 claims and June 30, 2019 for 2019 claims. So um, our results for 2020 and 2019 are comparable, but for Q1, um, Q1 and Q2 injuries have um, different maturity. For Q1 injuries, we have at most six months of data available. And for Q2 injuries, we have at most three months of data available. And so that for Q1 injuries, we observe some of the services that took place later in the uh, claim development. And that's reflected in the uh, larger um, averages here. Here, um, again, we're looking at the average number of days from injury to treatment, but for existing uh, claims, claims with injury dates in um, third quarter and fourth quarter of 2019 and 2018. And again, we don't see any evidence of delays in treatment and uh, we observe slightly shorter duration before first injury for both cores. So, so far we've seen no delays, no evidence of delays in medical treatment. And here we will um, see if percentage of claims with these uh, medical services was impacted by the pandemic or not. So here we're looking at the percentage of claims um, among non-COVID-19 last time claims, again, for, um, with um, evaluation and management uh, services, um, emergency room services, PT services, and surgeries. And now uh, for the first quarter of um, injuries, we uh, do see slight decrease, um, about three percentage uh, points decrease in the share of claims with surgeries and about the same uh, drop in uh, the share of claims with PT services. When we look at the um, claims with injury dates in the second quarter of 2020, then we do see uh, four percentage points decrease in the share of claims with emergency 
room services. So uh, patients do seem to be waiting emergency rooms in the second quarter of 2020. Um, here we again, we're looking at the share of uh, non-COVID-19 claims with these four types of services, but for existing claims. And the, the main message here would be that we see no difference in the share of claims with um, version management, ER, and PT services. Uh, however, we see a small reduction in the share of claims with surgeries. So there are some delays in um, receiving surgeries for um, this existing claims. Um, we also looked at the average number of visits for evaluation and management NPT services, and we find no evidence of change um, during pandemic. So let me summarize our findings. Uh, for COVID-19 claims, we find substantial variation in the prevalence of COVID-19 claims across states. We find that most of them occurred in the healthcare industry. For non-COVID-19 claims, um, we find large decreases in the volume of uh, non-COVID-19 claims. Uh, we'll also see increasing the share of last time claims uh, from 2019 to 2020. And when we looked at the medical treatment patterns, uh, we uh, found no change in time to first treatment and no change in the number of visits. However, we found some small impact of the pandemic on percentage of claims with surgeries, ER, or emergency room visits, and PT. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Alessia, for that excellent presentation. Well, I'm, I'm live here. Uh, waiting to see if Alessia can join us. I know she had had some technical difficulties. There she is. Okay. Hi, Alessia. Um, we're now live and ready to answer some questions from the audience. Um, so there's a really interesting one from Susan. Uh, you, you've shown that there is little or no impact of the pandemic on the delivery of medical care for all of your study states collectively. Would you see more of an impact if you had focused only on the states where the pandemic was severe in the first half of 2020? Uh, yes, and that's a very relevant question, especially given that we've shown some substantial variation across states and the impact of COVID-19. So we also had a concern about that. It was, what we did, we looked at, we computed similar measures for the most impacted states. And then the second quarter of 2000, 20, that was Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And when it comes to the um, um, timing from injury to first treatment, we saw very similar numbers. However, we see a little bit larger drops uh, in the share of claims for uh, evolution management, ER, and PT services especially in the second quarter of 2020. So there are some small, some differences in the share of claims, but not in terms of delays, no evidence again in delays of medical treatment there. Thank you for your question. So here's one from Michael. Um, was the impact of the pandemic on the number of non-COVID-19 claims different across industries? Um, Yes. So now what we, um, we do see decreases in the number of non-COVID-19 claims across all industries. We observe that. But then we do see variation in the impact by industry. And the industry that was least impacted was construction and trade. That, uh, this industry experienced about 25% in the volume of non-COVID claims. And the most impacted one was clerical um, and professional employees. They experienced about 57% uh, decrease in the 
number of non-COVID-19 claims. Uh, next, it was followed by low risk services and they experienced about 40% reduction and also high risk services and manufacturing were about 35%. So definitely um, differences there in the impact. And it's um, that would be expected because lockdown policies were industry specific and shift to work from home is not feasible for all industries. And you can see those elements align with what we observe. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so you actually mentioned high risk services, low risk services. There, there were a couple of folks who asked how it was that we made the distinction between the two. Yes, it's, an, um, it's a good question. And when we um, classified industry, service industries into high and low risk, we used incident rates for pre-COVID um, injury exposure. And um, in the high service, like examples of um, high um, risk service groups would be um, hospitals, facility, um, healthcare facilities, uh, restaurants, hotels, and examples of low risk services would be physician offices, um, also education and personal services. Great. So um, lots of questions coming in now. Um, so there's a question about uh, claims approval and denial rates and, and there, whether there's a, a there, is there any data on the variation by industry? Could that play a role in the proportion of claims that we're seeing? Um, again, it's a good question. And unfortunately, we don't have data on approval or denial rates. So we could not address that question directly. Um, however, we, uh, with um, our com sort of in comparison of the um, prevalence of COVID-19 claims and COVID-19 specific presumption laws, you, you saw there, um, there's a trend that states that had presumption laws in place, they had higher prevalence of COVID-19 claims. So it, it might be suggestive that um, ease of presumption would um, contribute to higher uh, prevalence of COVID-19 claims. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, Anne asked, uh, well, she, she observes that in her state, there has been a significant year over year reduction in the processing of formal claim settlements and wants to know if that is unique uh, and if WCRI is tracking this. And so I thought I might answer that one for Anne. Uh, at this point in time, we, uh, we don't have data to answer that question, but I do appreciate it. It's a great question that we will track in the future with, with uh, uh, subsequent rounds of data that we'll have. And so we'll certainly be following it in Anne's state as well as in other states. So um, Jenny asked um, or observed that she was surprised that there was no change in the mix of lost time injury types, not even an impact from a difference in mix of injuries uh, likely for service versus non-service occupations. And then she really wants to know whether the data had already been adjusted for mix of type of in industry. Um, we find um, we find in that injury composition didn't change um, from 2019 to 2020 for non-COVID um, claims, and that we were not expecting this result as well. So that was um, unexpected for us. Um, does that answer your question? Or <laughs> So um, unfortunately, we um, have some other great questions. Uh, I, think I, I think we have time for just one more. And so uh, this is more of conjectural, but um, we'll, uh, we'll add it out there. It's a, the question is based on your analysis, is it accurate to say that there will, uh, will not be a bump in medical costs in 2021 slash 22 due to treatment that may have been deferred during the pandemic shutdown. So the question really is, we didn't see much of a, of a delay in treatments, therefore we probably would not expect a bump in medical costs in 21, 22. 
and I'll just answer uh, to to Patrick's question that I, I guess that's an empirical question that we'll observe with the subsequent round of data. It does seem like a logical extension of uh, of the, of the findings of, of that we have, but uh, I think really again that remains to be seen. So thank you, Patrick, for a, a very good question. I, I'm sorry that we don't have more time to answer questions that have been posed to us. We really got a whole bunch of really great questions. I want to thank Dr. Fomenko for sharing her insights and to thank everyone for attending the session and for posting those really excellent questions. As always, please don't forget to rate this session as well as all the other sessions. We, as a reminder, we have a great panel discussion at 3.15 p.m. Eastern on responding to and moving beyond COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you.